welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators, and for all those that like really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador along for this journey. So as we continue um, on our virtual uh, around the world road trip, uh, per the World Health Organization's age-friendly uh, city global movement uh, during the World Health Organization's decade of healthy aging, uh, we are now headed down south uh, to the southern hemisphere to the beautiful country of Brazil. Uh, I'm honored today to be joined by Dr. Alexander Kalash, who is a medical epidemiologist who specializes in the study of aging, who is the president of the International Longevity Center in Brazil, which is an independent think tank based in Rio uh, that develops and promotes policy related to population aging, and co-president of the Global Alliance of International Longevity Centers, uh, an international consortium of member organizations with a mission to help society address longevity and population aging in positive and productive ways. Uh, Dr. Kalash graduated from medical school at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he got diplomas in infectious and parasitic diseases in medical education. Uh, he was ordered a master's in social medicine from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and his PhD in epidemiology at the University of London uh, and had a long academic career at the University of London and Oxford uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Kalash formally directed the World Health Organization's Global Aging Program, Department of the Aging and Life course that is headquartered in Geneva, uh, which resulted in the development of the assessment tool used by city planners and advocacy groups uh, known as the Global Age-Friendly City Guide. Uh, Dr. Kalash is formerly a senior policy advisor to the president on global aging at the New York Academy of Medicine a representative to the United Nations for International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics, Global Ambassador to Help Age International, Research Chair Professor in Elderly Healthcare Development at King Saud University in Riyadh, Associate Professor of the Andalusian School of Public Health in Granada, Spain, and member of the Brazilian delegation to the United Nations Open-Ended Working Group on Human Rights of Older People. Dr. Alexander Kalash, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. My pleasure, good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, typically, uh, we start off the show by uh, giving our guests the floor for a little bit, uh, just to talk about themselves. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, uh, talk a little bit about your background, um, where you grew up, how you got interested in medicine, uh, epidemiology, and ultimately, uh, why aging and longevity has become such an important uh, component of your career. Yes, I was born in Rio. Uh, this beautiful city. I'm speaking to you right now in a very difficult time. Uh, we are on the 8th of May. The pandemic has come to hit us in a big, big, big way. There are thousands of people dying. It's not a happy city, um, not the city that you could associate with Carnival. Mm. It is uh, taking a big toll. And I, I have to introduce, first of all, this aspect of life right now, because it's not easy to be in Brazil. And I can expand more about that, because it's all to do with policies and aging. As we know, the most important victims of the pandemics are people over 60. And there is so much confusion, so much ageism mm -hmm. uh, that we can spend a long time talking about that. But let me go back to my childhood. Sure. I was born in Rio, I was brought up in Rio. It was a city that was compelling. Um, it was the city at the time, the peak of many cultural activities, like the music, Bossa Nova, it was inspirational. It was not the violent city that we have today. Mm. And I'm not even saying that social inequality was not here. It was, it's just got worse. So it was a time that I started my medical school with a lot of activism. Um, I come from a very mixed background. My father was an immigrant from Syria. Uh, my grandfather was from Lebanon. My grandmother from Greece, 
and from my maternal side was a mix of Portuguese and Jewish Italian family. Hmm. So it's very mixed. Um, and I was brought up with the wonderful experience of having all these older people, very large Mediterranean family. Uh, my grandmother had 13 brothers and sisters, my grandfather 17 from my paternal side, also big family. And Ida, when I was a boy, there was only one option. Either, or two options. Either I would play with boys, because boys wouldn't play with girls, so it would be boys, or I would be around these fantastic older people in my family that would have wonderful stories firsthand. We didn't have video games. We didn't, in fact, have television, let alone any sophistication mm -hmm. like we have today. So the option that I would prefer was to be around older people and listen to all the stories that they had to tell. This will come much later because it has influenced the choice of aging as my career a specialty much later. But I did my medical course uh, in Rio. I was very interested in infectious disease because my interest, even before coming to medical school, was on public health. And I thought that in my country, in the 60s, I graduated in 1970 in Rio, I thought that in order to get to public health, I would need to know more about infectious diseases, tropical medicine, the diseases that were prevalent. Mm -hmm. I saw many children dying from infections that uh, was inadmissible even at the time. So that was my interest, but also I was very interested in training and medical education. I was very critical about the kind of medical education that I was receiving. And therefore, I was an activist, to always trying to push, to put pressure on the medical staff, my tutors, my professors, uh, in order to improve and to have a more community-based approach to medical learning. It was all very institutionalized in hospitals, and we would have very little connection with the social reality around us. That was a time that we didn't talk about the social determinants of health, but mm -hmm. in a word, that is what I was interested in. Then came a very dark period in Brazil. I was at medical school when the military regime was installed in Brazil. And as you know, it lasted for 21 years. So my days at medical school were the very beginning of the military dictatorship. Mm. And it was tough because my choice in public health would depend, of course, on the public employment. I couldn't do private medicine if I was interested in public health. So eventually I got a grant uh, and I went to the London School of Hygiene to do my master's degree in social medicine. That was after having my training in clinical medicine, infectious diseases and medical education, which were my immediate postgraduate training after my qualification. Then I got to England and I started looking around and say, my God, so many other people. I was coming from a very young country. Only 5% of the population was 60 and over. And I happened to be living with my, my family, my young children, right in front of a residential care facility. And I was looking at these happy older people and they were incredibly well looked after. So I thought, this is terrific. It's the place to grow older. I didn't realize that it was exceptional. It was a private and very good residential care facility. And little by little, we started to see that it's not so easy. But I started my master's degree, and about three months down the line, I saw a little note in the Lancet. It was a footnote to a medical article 
that completely changed my life from there on. It said that 83% of medical doctors working in geriatric medicine were from South Asia. Indian doctors from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, and a few from Egypt and, and other developing countries. And I thought, this is very strange. You know, why British qualified doctors are not interested to a specialty that should really be the forefront of their uh, medical practice? And I decided to bring together my interest on social medicine, but also medical education, uh, and try to understand why British qualified doctors were not choosing geriatric medicine. And I did a survey on the second year of my master's degree involving all members of the British Geriatric Society. Mm -hmm. That is, medical doctors that had already a firm interest on aging, so much so that they were members of the British Geriatric Society. And I did a survey in those days, there was no internet, it was a postal a survey with lots of questions trying to understand why. And I inserted the question that if you ask me why, I at the time wouldn't know the answer. But I asked them if they had lived with in close contact, in intimate contact with all their relatives in their childhood and adolescence. And that was the only question that could differentiate one group from the other. The group that had job satisfaction, they were geriatricians and were happy with the choice. And the other group, they had gone to geriatric medicine because it was a quick way to make a career and to reach the top of the career, becoming, uh, as they call in Britain, a consultant. Mm -hmm thought, well, that's interesting, says something about me. They are happy with geriatric medicine. They have job satisfaction because from the beginning of their lives, they had the right attitude. They were familiar with older people. They could feel good surrounded by older people. Then I did a second study in one of the medical schools in London, the Royal Free. Uh, asking uh, attitudes, it was a Likert scale attitude questionnaire, the kind of I strongly agree to a strongly disagree scale. Uh, the number of statements that were related to aging, old age, your attitude, the prospect of becoming a geriatric physician, and so on. There were small groups of eight students. Um, rotating. So I would receive eight students in the geriatric ward and then a month later uh, they would leave and another group would come and so on. So throughout the year I studied 10 groups and even before they would set their feet into the geriatric ward I would apply the first questionnaire and then two months later I would apply the same questionnaire again to see if there was a change and there was. In all groups, attitudes towards aging, old age, geriatrics, death, were better before than after. In other words, it was counterproductive to expose these students to a geriatric ward. And I would then have a focus group a discussion with the same students, asking them, tell me why we thought that by exposing you to geriatric medicine, you would become more interested in aging. And in, in all groups, they would say the bottom line, the same message. Are you surprised? You have, you have taken us away from high-tech medicine, the glamour, we think that we are saving lives, and suddenly you put us here with this depressed, abandoned, neglected by their families, multiple pathology, people uh, are confused, have dementia mm -hmm. uh, or their death, you cannot talk to them, and we are not familiarized with older people. We were brought up in nuclear families. We hardly got in 
touch with our own grandparents, let alone with older people. This is not a good way to start. Hmm. So it reinforced the same, that it, your attitudes at the beginning of your life, in your childhood, adolescence, are critical for you to have an interest. And as the world is aging, it is critical that we will have health professionals that are more interested and more knowledgeable about aging in all aspects. From that point on, I said, that's it. That footnote in the Lancet has shown me the way. And now I have the research, the results of these two research projects to show to me that I was right. My insight was correct that I should look at aging from a public health perspective. Mm -hmm. I moved to Oxford, I did my PhD while working there as a clinical lecturer, always focused on aging, aging, aging. But obviously, I started to dig out all the information and the statistics and the demographic trends. And I came to realize this has already happened in England and Europe, the old continent, but this is going to happen throughout the world. And I started looking at global aging mm -hmm. and became very involved with uh, aging. I participated at the first United Nations World Assembly on Aging mm -hmm. as member of the Brazilian delegation. That, that was in 1982 in Vienna. Uh, and continue to do a lot of training, training epidemiologists uh, from throughout the world. By that time, I had come back to the London School of Hygiene, and I was bringing together my main professional interests, medical education, training, aging, which I had acquired there, my passion for public health, and global aging, mm -hmm. with a focus on developing countries. Inevitably, <laughs> I say that uh, I laugh, because there was no competition. When I was recruited to WHO in 1994, Mm -hmm. uh, I was the only, pretty well, the only guy that was from a developing country, had an interest on aging. And I applied uh, for the post, which was called the Health of the Elderly. Mm -hmm. And I remember mm -hmm. at this, this uh, session, interview, interviewing me, uh, that I said, I, I don't even know what I'm doing here, because I, I don't think that the WHO should have a program or, the, or a department called Health of the Elderly. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me and said, why did you apply? I said, no, I applied because I would like to change from Health of the Elderly to aging. Mm -hmm. Aging is the important word. Everybody's aging. And unless I am able to convince all the other directors, all the other departments, from childhood to women health and violence to mental health, that aging is part of their uh, program, uh, I'm going to fail. And if I call the health of the elderly, they will look at me and say, oh, well, forget it. Aging is for tomorrow. No, aging is here to stay. And I spent 13 years uh, working as director of this department. Mm -hmm. And God, I mean, uh, was great. It was a, a great international experience. Um, the legacy that I left behind, I'm proud of. And when I left at the beginning of 2008, I then went to the New York Academy of Medicine with a very powerful program that I had just left in WHO, which is the Age Friendly Cities. And mm -hmm. I did all the, the, the fundamental research so that we could launch the guide at the end of 2007 with mm -hmm. 35 cities involved. And today we have over 2,000 cities of all sizes and communities from north and south to develop and developing countries. And now we are using the same approach, age-friendly, uh, to look at business, to look at universities, mm -hmm. to look at how people are trained, to look at media. So it continues to be my passion with a very strong focus and coming back to where I was as a medical student being an activist, no. now exhibiting this white beard. You know, I am an older person with 45 years of experience and knowledge accumulated on aging. 
I'm very happy that I'm a, vo a, a voice right now here with the pandemics, defending the rights of all the people and combating ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I appreciate I appreciate that overview, and it's uh, you know you, it's a very uh, elegant, exciting path that you've taken and continue to take in this space. And I take my hat off to you for that. Um, let, let's start now. That should we laid that base? Um, and so you you know you were so very integral in creating the 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 World Health Organization Aging and Life Course Group. And then the aging friendly cities, you know, falls under that domain. Um, I, I actually, before I came on a call today, I, I took a look at um, specifically at Brazil um, in the in the database, and I, I there was, uh, and I know I'm going to get these names. <laughs> I, I apologize ahead of time, uh, but Porto Alegre, Veranopolis, Estia, Pato Branco, Jaguariana, and, and I'm not going to try for the last one, but uh, so there's uh, six cities that are listed in the uh, WHO uh, Age Friendly City Guide. Can you take us a little bit because you you, know, you run International Longevity Centers Brazil, which is a think tank and it focuses on these issues of, of longevity and population aging, uh, a variety of topics. Can you talk a little bit about the focus of you, the group, uh, what you're focusing on, and then if you can take us on sort of, you know, obviously I sit up here in, in, on the East Coast of the United States, I've never been to Brazil, but if you could take us on a little virtual road tour uh, through maybe some of these cities and, and sort of what's going on right now connected to um, the Healthy Aging Program. Okay, let me um, go back a little bit because Ooh. the Age Friendly Cities uh, is founded on very firm grounds, which is a document that uh, WHO, the four under my guys, prepared over three years mm -hmm. um, and was presented at the second United Nations uh, World Assembly on Aging, which took place in Madrid. So we're going back to 2002, but from 1999, which happened to be the last year of the millennium, and the United Nations passed a resolution calling 1999 the International Year mm -hmm. of Older Persons. So it was to signal that something drastic is going to happen this next century, and it is aging. So it gave me the platform to interact with people from all over the world, academic groups, as well as civil society groups. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a global ambassador for uh, Help Age International. This morning I was on a seminar with the International Federation of Aging and I work with the International Association of Gerontology and so on. Sure. So involving all these groups as well as research groups, academic groups, both from the North and the South, we spent about three years, maybe more, bringing the health promotion perspective, and what is health promotion? It is uh, basically to uh, look at where people live. Health is created within the context of where people live and work and love and get entertainment, where they um, go from A to B to B to Z. So health promotion is something that is lively. Mm -hmm. um, I had set up the first master's degree at the London School on Health Promotion. Um, there wasn't any in the world. So I brought with me a very strong focus on health promotion and brought that to aging. And together with these researchers from around the world and civil society organizations, we wrote a document that is still very influential, which is active aging. Sure. If I could summarize what summar uh, the active aging is, Please. is, it is the process of optimizing the opportunities for the four things that are very important for you to grow old well, or for society to grow old well. And the opportunities for health, for lifelong learning, for participation, 
and for security. Obviously, health comes first. You may have all the money of the world in your pocket, but if your health is low, sure. the quality of your life is not going to be good. Second is lifelong learning, self-literacy. It's beyond health literacy. You need to learn throughout your life. The world is changing. The technology is forcing us uh, to learn, to learn, to learn. It's for no other good reason that UNICEF and UNESCO, OECD, uh, very important media such as The Economist are all focused today on lifelong learning. And in fact, my international center uh, here in Brazil, uh, we do international forums every year, on, each year on a specific theme, and last year was on lifelong learning. You have to learn to learn and to continue to learn from childhood to, to the grave. And that is the only way for you to be sure that you can, the third pillar of active aging, participate in society. If you're in good health, and if you have skills, knowledge, if you are learning throughout your life, it may not be easy, but it will give you the basic ingredients for you to continue to participate in your society. I'm saying that it may not be easy, because throughout the world there is a lot of ages and I don't like you because you are too old right. and I'm not going to give you an opportunity because you are too old mm -hmm. and you have to give space for the others that are young without realizing that the presence of older people in the public or in the private sector is very important in order to have the intergenerational uh, solidarity and also for one to learn with the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when all this fails, that you don't have health, you don't have knowledge, you cannot participate in society because societies are not using a rights-based approach, you need to be secure. The security, the last pillar of active aging. Protection. I need to, even if it is the basic, a roof on top of my head, food on the table, and perhaps some money in the pocket, even if it is just to buy the medicine that we now need to take. And millions, millions of people are not aging with this basic security and protection that is needed. So bringing this active aging perspective and the document that is still there, the WHO is still driving policies around the world, uh, I needed a way to put it in practice. It's no good to have a good framework that is just accumulated, accumulating dust in this shelf. Sure. And that was when it came to my mind that I'm going to try uh, to bring together the two demographic trends of the 21st century. One is aging, mm -hmm. the second is urbanization. Sure. Aging, for sure. Today, for instance, in Brazil, we have 14% of the population over 60. When I was a medical student, it was only five. But in 30 years from now, in 2050, it's going to be 31%. Mm -hmm. Almost like Japan today, which is the oldest country in the world. Sure. So in 30 years, we are going to be a big Japan with 67 million older people in Brazil. If I look a little bit ahead, if I look at, look at 2000, let's say 2070, 50 years from now, it's going to be 35% and 85 million people. I, I'm saying 50 years because I have been working for 50 years as a medical doctor. I graduated in 1970. And I'm here, active. I continue to work as much as I have throughout my life. And the likelihood of a medical student or a nurse or a psychologist or a journalist or an economist, whoever, to continue to work for 50 years if you are graduating in 2020, it's likely that you are still going to be working 
if you're lucky, it's 50 years from now. Yep. So aging is going to influence the career development of young people today. And by 2050, we are going to have 2 billion, 100 million older people, 83% of them in the South, in developing countries. So that is one trend, aging. The other is urbanization. When I was born in Brazil, the total population was about 45 million. Mm -hmm. And one third of that in, living in urban areas. So it was massively a rural country. Today we are approaching 90% of the population living in cities, urban, but it is 90% of 215 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the total rural population has remained more or less the same. But the number of people in urban areas is phenomenal. It's a completely different country. And I could see while working for WHO and obviously looking at the work of other United Nations agencies like Habitat, UNFPA, UNDP, that this is to pay attention. Urbanization is going to influence the 21st century. Well, today we have, in 2007, the United Nations declared that there were, for the first time ever in history, more people living in urban areas than in rural areas. Um, by 2030, it's going to be close to two thirds. So it's very rapid urbanization, like what has happened in Brazil. So bringing together the two ideas, it was to bring aging mm -hmm. and urbanization with the active aging as the framework so that I could use that framework and translate into practice and to launch the age-friendly cities movement and the age-friendly cities guide based on qualitative research using the same methodology that was devised in in vancouver right. but the the whole idea and I, i'm going to move just a little bit because i'm going to show everybody from where I am speaking and where this idea took root. Please. I was born and brought up here in Copacabana. And there it is. And this is my home environment. I could come through the computer. You can see that the, sea, the beach is empty because we are under quarantine. Oh, yeah. Beautiful number. But when we talk about Copacabana, most people will think about the beach, beautiful women in bikinis, strong guys playing volleyball, football, festival, music, carnival. It is that. But Copacabana today, and even in 2005, when I launched the idea at the International Congress of Gerontology, which took place here in Rio, that was the first time that I start talking about age-friendly cities. Mm -hmm. I asked the international participants, there were over 5,000, close your eyes and I'm going to say a word and you are going to tell me what is associated with this word. Mm -hmm. And they said, Copacabana. <laughs> they had their eyes closed and I said, okay, who thought of uh, a beach? Lots of hands up, okay. Who thought of uh, beautiful women in bikinis and guys playing football? Who thought of festival and music and carnival and all these hands? And then I said, okay, who thought of old age? Nobody. Mm. By then, Copacabana had already 30% of the population over 60. Mm. And this was to do with urbanization. Copacabana is surrounded by hills. And until 1920s, 1930s, when they start perforating tunnels so that the population could come to live in Copacabana Beach, although it's close to the historical downtown, it was impossible to live here because you didn't have the communication, couldn't have public transport. 
and the generation of my parents were the first young couples that moved to Copacabana and raised their family here. Uh, and then the children and grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren, uh, have moved to other districts. Mm -hmm. You may have heard of Ipanema. Sure. Ipanema Beach. Have you heard of the girl from Ipanema? The I music? The song? Many times, but yeah. I, I... Many times. Tra -la -da 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 -da. The girl from Ipanema is today 78. You know, I, I saw something about that. Okay, keep going. I, I, I remember reading about this. Go ahead. Okay, that, that is something that we, I always mention in, in, in talks. And we age. Mm -hmm. Even the girl from Ipanema. Even the girl from Ipanema. And Copacabana is a district of old age. It's like Manhattan. It's mm -hmm. like central London. And that is the difference that I wanted to express when I asked them to close their eyes in the first study uh, that we conducted that then subsequently led to the Age-Friendly Cities Guide mm -hmm. was here in Rio mm -hmm. with one very important principle, protagonism. Ask all the people what they want, what their problems are, what their suggestions to correct these problems are. And that is the foundation for the age friendly cities. Mm -hmm. It is nothing for us without us. And you need to constantly go back to all the people to say, is that what you mean? Is that what you want? Is this friendly enough to satisfy your desires and aspirations? Moving along those themes, um, and you know, st well, staying on the theme of ageism for a minute, but now adding in um covid uh covid in developing countries uh and you know, whether we, we continue to talk about ageism inequality uh lack of resources and so forth uh tell us tell us a little bit what's going on now i mean I, you showed us the, showed me the beach no one's on it uh same issue up here and on the u.s uh east coast it's kind of quiet and, and deserted um let, let's bring in this this issue that obviously COVID's killing all sorts of people, but killing a large percentage of uh, of the elderly. Um, strategies, ideas, thoughts on on, on this uh, current uh, crisis that we are in uh, along this ageism and aging dynamic. First thing that I would like to say is that people, many people, are die unnecessarily. Agree with that. because the health sector has not responded as it should and because there is ages i heard my president here in brazil saying and so what there will be some people that will die they are old this is the ultimate lack of empathy mm -hmm. lack of solidarity humanity and he doesn't realize himself that he's 65. It's always, all the person is somebody else. Yes. It's nothing to do with me. And unless people will interject the fact that you are old or you are going to grow older and that it is a privilege to grow older, what is the other option to die young? I'm not interested. <laughs> I have never been interested. Yeah. Therefore, we have to make sure that we're going to grow older, but to have quality of life. So that the first thing is that people don't see themselves as the older person. But I said that people are dying unnecessarily. And there is one thing in common between our countries. You are there in Philadelphia, and I'm here in Brazil. People are dying unnecessarily in the United States today, to the shame of the richest country in the world, where dozens of thousands of people are dying because you don't have a public health system. Because you spend 18.5% of your colossal GNP and spend $10,000 per capita, but you leave so many people. And these people that are left behind are the people that are dying. It is exceptional to be a rich person to die from coronavirus. 
what we are seeing is that four times more black people die in the United States than white people. Latinos the same. What is behind here? What explains that people go to a residential care unit thinking that they will be secure and protected and abandoned even by their staff as it has happened in France, in Spain, in Italy? Where is the protection that I was talking about, one of the pillars of active aging, when countries are not prepared to deal and treat with humanity? And in any time of history, civilization can be assessed by the way you deal and protect the most vulnerable. So both your country and mine are failing, and they are the worst in the Americas. Why is this happening here? Because politicians are fighting and they don't speak with the same voice. You have one voice coming from the Minister of Health and one voice coming from a populist ultra-right wing president mm -hmm. that doesn't understand about science, doesn't want to know about science, all his concern is, I want to be reelected, and if the country goes into recession, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> Therefore, nothing to do with horizontal isolation. So he speaks with one voice and his fanatic supporters, it's about 30%, it's sizable. So I'm talking about 45 million people, follow what he says. I have just shown that the beach is empty because at state level, and the mayor of Rio have got the message. If we don't implement a very strict social isolation, we are going to have the public and the private sector, public health, health system collapsing. We have 95% of intensive care unit beds in Sao Paulo and Rio, the richest cities in the country, already occupied. What are we expecting to happen 10 days from now? If people hear the president saying, go back to work, people that are going to die are older people. It's not only to protect older people, it's to protect the health system. Right. And by the way, in my country, one third of the deaths, more than 30% of the deaths are under the age of 60 because they, people age prematurely mm -hmm. with comorbidity. They have hypertension, diabetes, they have all the problems that you don't expect to have well after the age of uh, 50, 60, 70, 80. And they will have these diseases uh, well before. I'm talking about social determinants of health. Yeah. Bad diet, no opportunity to have physical activity. They cannot pay to go to, an, to a gym. They cannot even walk freely because there is violence, sure. because there is no pavement, because the light is bad. Because if you're a woman, you're afraid of being sexually harassed or, or even worse, raped. So all this will lead to this very large group of people in my country that are dying well before the age of 60s from coronavirus, while we know that in, in Europe, most of the deaths were over the age of, not even 60, over the age of 70 plus. Mm -hmm. We've spoken uh, on the show with folks like yourselves in different parts of the world that are, you know, are, are focused on the, the issues of healthy cities. Um, and, and, and these related concepts. We, we, we looked at Los Angeles, we looked at the, the country of Ireland. Uh, now we're talking with you in Brazil. Um, although the other side of things, uh, we spend a lot of time on uh, emerging technologies, uh, products, services uh, to potentially enhance um, healthy uh, longevity uh, and quality of life. And, and, and in Brazil, Right now, I mean, there's a, there's quite a few very interesting uh, sets of research going on um, 
on this front that, that I, on people that I stay in touch with and I, I talk to all the time. Um, there's uh, fascinating work in the area of, uh, of transplantation technology at Sao Paulo Research Foundation by uh, uh, Dr. Mayana Zatz. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on, of course, in, in various endemic diseases uh, to Brazil. Um, my friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Odorico uh, Morris Fijo at uh, the, the Federal University, uh, he works on this fascinating technology for, for burns uh, using uh, fish skin, uh, sort of local resources. A lot of neat stuff really going on, um, but it's, it's a small fraction probably of everything. Um, are there interesting uh, research programs, technologies, things along this line that, that as you are down there now in, in Brazil, you, uh, you are hopeful, interested in uh, things that may be able to impact um, this, this whole area in terms of healthy longevity uh, that you see coming out of local uh, universities, uh, think tanks, uh, private organizations, uh, in Brazil that uh, are interesting to you? My first comment here is that in a very large country like Brazil, 250, 15 million people, if you, let's say, say 20% of them are good consumers of health products and health insurance, let's say one third, we're talking about 70 million. Yep. We're talking about a population that is bigger than Argentina. You're talking about a population that is bigger than France or Spain Absolutely. or Britain. So there is a lot of uh, interesting new ideas, uh, mm -hmm. research. You are mentioning some of them. We have centers of excellence from transplantation to immunotherapy or but you don't look at the diseases of the poor. And I'm much more interested to know what we can do in order to help ordinary people that don't have access to this high tech, okay. that cannot afford them. Simple things that will make a huge difference. I'm very uh, afraid to say this, and I'm going to show my iPhone. Brazil is a country where there are more iPhones than the total number of the population. Mm. We embrace very quickly new technologies. Mm -hmm. You can also have an iPhone, a smartphone, and be illiterate. It is transformation. Right. But you have an iPhone, a smartphone in your hand, and you're fitting the sewage because 50% of the population in Brazil don't have access to the basic sanitation. Mm. There are 30 million people in my country without proper water supply. If they have any, it may be for an hour or two hours, and then COVID comes, mm. and you say, you have to wash your hands, but we don't have water. Mm. But you have to wash your hands. We don't have money to buy soap. So. Whenever I am posed with this question, the contradictions, the inequalities, Brazil is the most unequal country in the Americas. It's one of the most unequal countries in the world. Yes, you have high technology. You have the wonders of medicine. Mm -hmm. And if I will be sick tomorrow, I want to go to the... Jewish hospital in Sao Paulo, or the Syrian Lebanese hospital in Sao Paulo, or the German hospital in Rio, or whatever. There are centers of excellence. But the basic thing that we have in Brazil, that you don't in the States, is, have, is to have a national health system. Mm -hmm. Based on the British model. Universal coverage. It's interesting that you are asking me this question, because last week, not last week, last month, the owner of the most influential newspaper conglomerate in Brazil, Globo, also television, radio, social media, incredibly influential. And he needed uh, liver transplantation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he couldn't do it in, 
in a private hospital. Hmm. So he ended up using the national health system. Like all my friends, I still live in, in London. I still have my house in London. My, my children were brought up there and lived there. Hmm. And I know what it is to have a national health system. They have failed to respond on time for the coronavirus, not because they didn't have the best epidemiologists to advise the government, but because the government has just gone through Brexit and they were interested in doing populist policies and didn't act on time. They didn't hear the science that should have pointed to the British people early on in February, March, horizontal isolation, we need a very strict policy here. It is inadmissible that even the prime minister, the same prime minister that belongs to a party that is trying to, in a very subtle way, erode the national health system. But that is where he was treated. And when he left the hospital, he was thankful and grateful to the great treatment that saved his life. Now I wanted to see if he's going to be committed to save and to strengthen the national health system. Now I wanted to see if in New York, in Philadelphia, wherever, in New Orleans, if Mr. Trump is going to strengthen the national health system and for, at long last, set up a proper universal coverage because there are millions of people that are left behind, which explains why the Latinos and the black people are dying four times more often than the white population, which is not what happens next door in Canada. Alex, what, um, obviously you've been, you've been spending, you know, you spent the last few decades, uh, you know, making your mark in this area, uh, clearly a visionary, a thought leader. Um, What's next? Uh, what What do you see yourself doing? And what do you any any big plans? Any things you want to announce? New projects? Um, further expansion of the Healthy Cities uh, program in Brazil? What I'm sure you have tons of things going on. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the next. Uh, well, you know, here we are, the, the World Health Organization decade of aging. Um, what do you have planned between now and 2030? Let me just first make a little. Correction. It's not healthy cities, but age friendly. Age friendly cities. It is very well informed by the Health Cities movement that started in 1986, mm -hmm. immediately after the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. And I participated in that think tank, and that enlightened me. It was a good model for me to launch the age friendly cities. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do next? First of all, Look at me. You see this white beer here? You see this old man here? No. First thing that I want to do is to survive the epidemics. Oh, yeah. Me too. I'm staying here in my home. I have the privilege of having a spacious apartment with beautiful view overlooking Copacabana. I see the sun rising. I get the stimulation. But that is now not how old the people in general in Brazil live, let alone in Africa or in parts of Asia, let alone in Bronx, Queens, or Baltimore. That is not the way that people are aging. And what my first commitment is, is to survive. I don't want to die from coronavirus. Yeah. And I have a good model to follow. Okay. My mother was born in the very year of the Spanish pandemic flu hmm. in 1918. And she's 102 now. Wow. So I have a good model to follow. Yes, you do. And she lives next door. That is my other commitment. My commitment is to be alive because I still have lots of plans and projects. My immediate challenge is not to die from this coronavirus. My second commitment is to be here to look after her, to provide care to her. She's frail with Alzheimer's. 
But in the long term, I still see myself being active for a number of years. I cannot be precise. For as long as, and I go back to active aging definition, that I am in good health and that I can follow the technology, that I can learn new tricks. Mm. Don't come with this idea that an old dog doesn't learn new tricks. Yes, we can learn new tricks. It's different though, the way I learn today. And also, I have now the delete button. There are things that I don't want to storage. I delete, Psst, go. I don't want to clutter my memory with things that are not very important. And I want to fill my, my brains mm -hmm. with more philosophy, with more culture, with knowledge that I can think laterally. And in a way, I have done that in the past and I will continue to do. For instance, I'm very strong in this new movement, which is the age-friendly universities, something that we started about 10 years ago and is now led by the City University of Dublin. Okay. And we have 67 universities around the world. And we were going to have the third international conference on age-friendly universities uh, here in Brazil at the end of the year. We have just decided to postpone it to next year because of the coronavirus. Did, what, what from in the university? Just say, you could define that a little bit, exactly what that means. Yeah, we have 10 principles. If you are interested, you can look at the uh, Dublin City University. These 10 principles are there, but basically is to bring all the people to the university. It's for them to be protagonists and to continue to learn. But also commitment that university will have to bring aging as a cross-cutting theme. Mm -hmm. I give the example of a, a medical doctor. We don't learn enough from anatomy, physiology, physiopathology, pharmacology, interaction of medicine, presentation of diseases, and so on. Because we have the model of a young, usually male body, and it doesn't work. Mm. You learn anatomy in this splendid body that is 25, and then you need to find the spleen of an obese lady age at 88. You're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. You are going to mix the wrong dosage medicine that can bring lots of side effects. You may kill your patient ignorant. You don't even suspect that you are killing your patient. But this example that is so graphic in medicine applies to urban planning, architects, lawyers, journalists, everybody. We will need to train professionals for the 21st century. And we are training professionals for the 20th century. So to bring aging as a cross-cutting thing so that the curriculum, not only in medicine or in health profession, Mm -hmm. uh, but throughout the university. And that is the essence of an age-friendly university, is to prepare okay. professionals for the century. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on things. Uh, and and it's, a real, it's a real fascinating set of projects and, and, and history and everything you've been involved in. Uh, I, don't think you're, <laughs> I don't think your beard's going to hold you back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just like my gray sideburns will not, uh, I, I'm going to keep moving forward as well. But um, it, it's really been, you know, a pleasure listening to uh, you talk with passion about these topics. Uh, you have amazing ideas and thoughts. Uh, and, and for everybody that is going to be uh, watching this episode on the Idea Me YouTube channel or listening on the Idea Me podcast, uh, you've been listening to the amazing Alexander Kalash, uh, president of the International Longevity Center in Brazil, uh, co-president of the Global Alliance of International Longevity Centers, uh, doing truly amazing things uh, to usher in this, uh, this these continual era of, of healthy aging, healthy longevity, uh, age-friendly cities. 
Um, Alex, thank you for taking the time today to come on and talk with us. Uh, thank you for everything you do. Uh, and then as we say on the show, thank you for uh, allowing us to move the human story forward. Uh, it's really uh, a, a, an amazing uh, set of accomplishments and really appreciate everything. I have a couple of two things that I would like to add, if keep I may. Keep going, keep going. Because you ask me what's next, what's the future? I will continue to passionately fight ages. Yep. I'm very committed to help to have a convention on the rights of all the people at the United Nations. That is one of my main tasks, is to participate at the open-ended working group. We have been doing this for 10 years. We are not making the fast progress that I would like to see because developed countries are are really against, they are very ageist, they don't want to see rights because rights means entitlements and they don't want to spend more money on all the people. So there is a very ageist attitude here and I have this strong commitment. And the other uh, new front um, is age-friendly employer, age-friendly business. Okay. And in November, we launched in Boston uh, answering to a provocation from Governor Barker, uh, the governor of Massachusetts, uh, and using the expertise of uh, the age doc employer, uh, which is led by Tim Driver with a group uh, based in Boston. And I am now a co-director of this newly founded age-friendly Boston. Mm. Uh, Barker's uh, I, uh, vision is to s see Boston and Massachusetts for aging what the Silicon Valley is for technology. Mm. So if you think of technology, you yeah. think of San Francisco and the Silicon Valley and so on. In the future, we hope that if you think of aging, new technologies with all the powerhouse of the Harvards and MIT and so on. So I'm now spending more time in Boston. We launched this initiative there in November. And I expect this is going to grow. Excellent. Don't forget about Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, it was good seeing you. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Really okay. Really Take good care. Yeah.